Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Scott McGilvery, and this is the Real Estate Rebel Podcast. Now, don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And listen, if you want more real estate investing information, or you want to know more about the uh, discussion on this podcast, go to scottmcgilvery.com for more details. Now, I'm really excited about today's episode and our guest. She is a friend of mine. She is super smart. You may have seen her on TV. She does radio appearances and speaking engagements. She is an award-winning author and educator. Her financial literacy advocacy is off the charts. And when it comes to learning how to keep your money, there is nobody better than Kelly Keen. I'm going to have her on the show today, and we're going to be talking about the five things that you can do right now that'll make you rich in 10 years. So my guest on the show is Kelly Keen. Kelly, welcome to the show. So great to be with you, Scott McGillivray. Yeah, I'm excited for this one because you and I have, you know, we've crossed paths many times and we've had these conversations before. You know that I'm a real estate investor and I'm pretty aggressive when it comes to investing. You are like you are like the ultimate safety net when it comes to money and 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 I listen and I think we I look at us as super compatible because as far as I'm concerned wealth is is a couple of things. It's not only how much money you can make, it's also how much money you can keep, right? Oh, I just I love that about what you make and what you keep because it is absolutely so essential. And you know, as a very successful real estate investor, it's about the profit, it's about what you keep in your hands and are able to reinvest. So I'm just so delighted to be here. You said something, I wrote this down. You said whether someone has a billion dollars in the bank or a million dollars in the hole, everyone has money problems. Why is that? I think they do. So for the last 15 years, I've been a financial educator. So I don't provide advice. I educate through writing books and, and you know, stuff like you do, Scott. But for 12 years, I was in the financial industry and it really gave me an eye opening experience, especially coming in so young that I would get to actually see the balance sheets of people because, you know, we look at people and you naturally compare yourself and Really, it's only been recently, like if you think about all of history, if you were poor, you looked poor. And if you were wealthy, everyone knew you were wealthy. Today, you can just look like a million bucks and be swimming in debt. So because I got to actually see people's balance sheets when I worked at the bank at a very early age, I tell you, Scott, like someone would come to my desk that just was a very modest means to renew a $10 million GIC. And I'm like 21 years old going, wow, they didn't pull up in a Bentley. They pulled up in like a beat up Toyota Corolla or, you know, the person that looked like just like a gazillion dollars. And all of us thought that this individual was kind of like a local celebrity. And I'd look at their balance sheet and they were like $2 million in debt. And I was just like, how is this possible? And so then I opened my own firm and, and that's why I got out and wrote my first book on the psychology of money as a non-psychologist, because I was like, you know, a, a lot of my clients that had a lot of money didn't enjoy it. And a lot of clients that enjoyed their money, they didn't keep it. So it was all about, and, and I have my own money issues. Uh, I'm very honest about that in all of my books. So <laughs> that's why for the last 15 years, I've been writing about it a lot. And I also have to tell you, Scott, we're going to have some really great debates here right away. And you're right. I think we complement each other. But I got to tell you, I do lead with the bias of loving real estate. I really do. I've not always been successful with it. Um, but I, I do have that bias. So I will put it, that out there as well. That's why we love each other. Because you love real estate. I love real estate. Can I do um, a heart? I don't know how to do the heart. Yeah. I don't know. I'll let you do the heart. Something you said there, you know, you just you completely painted a picture in my mind of like, the fact that it is hard to identify who's wealthy and who's poor these days. But usually it's not what you expect. Like you see somebody walking down the street with $500 shoes, $800 jeans, and $1,000 earphones. That's probably the most broke person ever versus like somebody's walking with, you know, $50 jeans and a ripped t-shirt, that's probably a millionaire. Like you don't even know for sure. And I think that's part of, part of that is sometimes can be translated to 
you know, the mindset of, of wealth, which is, you know, for me, when people are like, how did you become wealthy? One of the first things they said is I stopped caring about buying consumer goods. Like I really, I'm, I don't care what I drive. I don't care what, you know, I'm wearing this, this shirt. I've had this shirt for 10 years and I got it for free uh, from an event. Like, and I like it. I'm like, why would I spend money on shirts when I have one that I got for free? Right. <laughs> and so it, that's something that I think needs to be taught at a young age. And I know we're going to go through these, these five points that are going to help people become wealthy because I, I think we're going to have a lot of uh, consistency. And the first thing is about financial literacy, understanding money. Um, if you don't understand what money is uh, and you get it wrong, you might think that being rich is about having expensive earphones when realistically it's probably about having an investment in the bank that gives you a positive return that would make you smarter, right? Yeah. And I love your shirt, Scott. And that's such a great story because I think too, the crisis has really opened our eyes or it certainly has for me. I can be very consumer driven. I told you I've got my own money issues. I, I grew up poor but had very wealthy uncles that invested in real estate. So I'm having to always fight this poor kid syndrome, um, which I think I've kind of you know wrangled, but it still, it still creeps up. But for me, COVID and the crisis has really, I call it the slow bit because you couldn't buy stuff. You couldn't go out and get the things you used to get. So it's yeah. for, for myself and, and my husband, it's been about more a, an appreciation about the things that we have, but that's really, really hard to do. And again, we want to look and compare ourselves to other people. And we think that, like you said, those showy things mean wealth. And uh, one of the mistakes I made early on in my career, because I was so young in the financial industry, keeping up with my really wealthy clients and I wasn't making what they were making, a couple of uh, uh, things really hit home for me was, you know, I wanted to appear bigger. So I bought myself a Mercedes Benz that I couldn't afford, but I was running with that crowd that said, you know, you should have a fancy luxury car. Now, thank goodness I kept it for like 12 or 14 years. So at least I got a little bit of value from it. But what Scott, when I went and traded in my car, and it's funny because I told this story on the Marilyn Dennis show. It was one of the first episodes I was on with our friend Marilyn. And I, my husband was like, look, you are a financial literacy advocate now. You have to advocate for financial literacy is yes. it prudent for you to be buying a luxury vehicle? And then, you know, I have some friends that are also doctors without borders. And they were like, oh, really? Yeah. Like, could you, couldn't you just get a fully loaded something else for half the price of a luxury vehicle? That could like fix the, you know, cataracts of, of thousands of people. So long story longer, I bought a Hyundai Sonata that I love that if it had a Mercedes symbol on it, I, I would just think it was like the cat's meow and we're still driving it like 12, 10 years later. So really learned that lesson and learned that here's another thing, Scott, and I know you know this, but I would have people that would come into my office when I had my firm and I was at the bank that were multimillionaires, that were teachers, that were, um, you know, like just of modest means, maybe a professor, like not someone that made a lot of money. And they own several apartment buildings and rental properties. And I was just blown away how they would just, like you said, not spending on the cars, the toys, the, all that type of stuff, saying, I could have $500 shoes or I could take $500 a month to save a down payment to buy something that's going to be a revenue stream or invested in the market or however you invest. And it, mind blowing. It's, it is. It, and I think, it, you know, we're and more and more so we're growing up in a society where everyone wants instant gratification. And I, I am a, I'm always trying to find a balance point because you don't want to kill people's motivation and you don't want to kill momentum. You want people to be inspired. You want them to be entrepreneurial. I really believe in that spirit. And I believe it's it's the you know, it's the flame. It's the ignition point that can really spark something incredible. But at the same time, I want to be realistic with people about the fact that, you know, you need to hold on to that energy for the long run because, you know, you're not going to see the results right away. The, the things that have the greatest reward in life have a delayed gratification to them. And I, I, I think about it as like, like a farmer is a perfect example, a classic example of, of how wealth can be generated the same way they create food. Um, 
you know, they do a ton of work in the spring. They're plowing the fields. They're planting the seeds. They're weeding. Like, they're up early, out late, watering, whatever needs to be done. But, you know, for those first few weeks that they're working hard, they don't just stop and say, okay, let's go out and pick everything when it's one inch tall. Now they got to wait and they got to water it. And they might be hungry, but it's too soon to harvest. But at the end of the season, all that hard work that they earned nothing for for many, many months pays off exponentially because there's more food than you could ever eat for the rest of your life. And I tell people wealth is the same way. It's the sooner you start, the better off you're going to be, but you're going to have to be patient because you're not going to get the rewards right away for your efforts. It's about accumulating the rewards to later. And I still want to argue that it's 10 years. In 10 years, you can create a substantial amount of wealth if you put in a tremendous amount of work in year one and two, right? I just, I love your agrarian analysis. I think that's really, if we could think a little bit more like that, and you're right, I, I'm challenging your your 10-year wealth creation, but also I think you're right that so many people want it right now, and they don't, I, I love that, that they don't understand that they can't pick those seeds up right now. So what can we, what should we be teaching people about financial literacy that they're not learning? Because I have a few, you know, I have a few tips. So I'd love because you're an author about this, you know, you're a financial educator, you have, you've done one of the smartest things ever, which is you've learned from so many other people's mistakes by watching them come to you with their financial problems, uh, and, and and wins as well. What do you think we should do in order to shatter people's current beliefs, or maybe, you know, even better, teach people from a young age, how to be wealthy? I think there's a few things, Scott, and you probably can answer this as well. I'll, I'll volley it right back to you right away. But, um, you know, there's a few things. Number one, you've got to know the basics. Like we hear this all the time. People spend more effort planning their vacation than they do their finances. I know uh, I go to New York City a lot. I took my husband there about, you know, last summer and I spent an inordinate amount of time trying to represent for him, right? Like research the best patios and everything like that. And I thought, my goodness, have I spent that much time on my finances recently? Like people will spend so much time. And if we were, let's say, to take up the game of golf, or if you were a new Canadian and you were going to start watching hockey, you'd want to know the verbiage. You'd want to know that there's 18 rounds of golf, um, that, you know, a bogey's a bad thing. You'd want to know that there's that there's three periods in a game of hockey and a hat trick is a good thing. It's going to make the game so much more fun. But when it comes to finance, people don't know the basics. Like I was doing a show, you know, this burn my mortgage. And and I remember it was all about how to get your mortgage paid down sooner. And the crew kind of started grumbling a few episodes in like, you know, those banks, they really want to park you and your money. And, and I was like, hey, hold on a minute. The stuff that we're conveying on the front lines to these people about how long it's going to take them to pay their mortgage and how much interest they're paying and all this type of stuff. I'm like, they knew that. They actually signed, they initialed next to that on their mortgage document. And every single bank actually has an online calculator to show you if you just put a hundred bucks more a month or 50 bucks more a month, how quickly you could burn your mortgage. I was like, this show is redundant. Like there's no reason for it. But when it comes to finance, where there's shame, there's embarrassment, there's our story scripts that we've been told. And so we're just scared of it. So we do nothing. And your, your uh, agrarian analogy too, Scott, I've got one in, in one of my books where I talk about what kind of financial house do you want? And I think it's really important that people get honest with themselves. So I ask, do you want a house? Do you want an apartment building? Or do you want an office tower? Like what kind of financial life do you want to build for yourself? Because if you just want a house, you're that kind of person, just put some money in GICs, make your life real easy. You don't really have to be uncomfortable. You're good to go. You want an apartment building, you have to build a little bit more of a foundation, takes longer to build. But if you want that skyscraper, you really got to understand finance, dig deep into your psyche to make sure you're not going to sabotage yourself and do stupid stuff. Um, you know, and I've seen a lot of people real estate and investment wise just sabotage themselves as soon as they started to get successful. So getting honest and then getting, you know, learning the basics and not saying, hey, I didn't learn it in school. I had participation in school. Hal and Joanne, remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had those lessons about how to eat properly and all of this. And today in 2020, we have an obesity epidemic. It didn't work. They taught us. 
about health. It didn't work. So I'm not saying we don't need personal finance in school, but I'm just saying, will it work if where kids are learning their personal finance from is their parents? It's the parents that have to set the example. That's a, that's a really good point. I mean, you learn so much watching your parents. And I, <clears throat> I think back to when I was a kid, I mean, my parents were extraordinary savers. You would be a huge fan of my parents. I mean, a coupon never hit the recycling bin in our house, even if it was like five cents off, it was not <laughs> going to get thrown out. But you know, you, you also can't save your way to prosperity, you know, because we weren't, we weren't wealthy by any means. We were always struggling. And, um, you know, I think maybe it's not that it, maybe we need a combination of financial literacy in our education system. Parents need to be able to have some sort of way to teach their children. Um, but at the same time, if we, if we could bring both together and make sure that people understand that, yeah, you have to learn from example, both what to do and also what not to do is really important. Um, you know, we, I watched my parents and at first I thought, okay, this is, these are all the things I have to do. And then I realized one day I'm like, you know, and I knew people who were, we had, we had this neighbor who ended up meeting someone really wealthy and. I remember going to his house like this, you know, this woman met this man and they they she moved out of the neighborhood and they were in this huge like house. And I was like, holy moly, I've never been in a mansion like this. Like we come from this little neighborhood walking around. And I started asking the guy so many questions. And the thing that blew my mind, I, you know, I asked him I'm like, wow, you're so rich. What do you you know, what's your job? And he looked, he looked both ways, you know, kind of making sure no one was really listening. And he leaned in and he said, said, you can't become wealthy like this with a job. He's like, I don't have a job. And I remember thinking, whoa, how is that possible? I thought you had to have a job to be wealthy. My head, my head exploded. So I am on board with you with that, that you have to have a different mindset. You have to want to learn these things and it has to happen at home and in school in order for people to to be able to understand how money works. Yeah, and there's nothing saying that you can stop that script that you didn't learn it in school. Like you're teaching courses, a lot of people are teaching courses, get some personal finance books, understand what an RSP is versus paying down your debt versus what a like basics about your mortgage, like understand these things understand your risk tolerance and all these types of things. And maybe you'll be pleasantly surprised that, you know, I talk to a lot of young millennials that say, I can never afford a home. And it's like, is that in fact true? Let's actually run the numbers and see, like, you know, if you, if you don't look at the numbers and you don't understand how you could come to those numbers, you don't even give yourself the opportunity for the possibility of it. Agreed. Agreed. And maybe you have to change what you consider a home as well, because there's always something you can afford. You just have to be realistic about what it is. So, but uh, I want to get on to the second thing here, which is about a career. You know, we talk about a job and, um, you know, I, I truly believe that we have one of the best education systems in the world for creating workers. Like if you, if your dream in life is to have a career and a job, then absolutely, we have the school system for you. You graduate, what's the first thing happens when you graduate college or university? You go get a job or you go to, go to a job fair. We do not have an education system that creates entrepreneurs and leaders and managers and critical thinkers. Um, that's, that stuff is not taught in our, in our education system. It's something you need to learn after you get an education, perhaps, or alternatively to getting an education. But... That's not to say that having a job is a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. Um, and I want to, I want you to tell me about what are the best, you know, what are the best parts of having a job or how can you use your job in order to create wealth in your future? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And, and totally agree with you, Scott. I think there's like a, a balance. I think you can be someone like you or I, where we're all in and making money a different way. But I think there's also an opportunity for people that have a job to use it as an asset class, but just see it as an asset class. So you're looking at a balanced portfolio. If you've got a super safe job, you know, you're a professor with tenure, you're a nurse or whatever it is, like that is, that's a, a solid asset class. I think, 
uh, you can look at being more risky, maybe with your investments. Now, if you're an entrepreneur and you have some investments, you're already making up that equity component. You might want to be a little bit more safe with your investments. So, you know, you need to look, and I don't think the industry looks at people's careers as an asset class. Like it shouldn't be your, like you said, it's like probably not going to get rich that way. So if your asset class happens to be kind of like low risk, low return, then you've got to find some ways to bring some equity into your life, either metaphorically or literally, because you need that to balance out. Now, some other ways I think people can really maximize their careers is by negotiating, especially women. We don't do that. And there's a great book that I love called Women Don't Ask. And they estimate that by women not negotiating their step starting salary and subsequent salaries, that they leave over a million dollars on the table during their working life. Now, that's a big chunk of Whoa. change. Um, that's a big but chunk it, of change. it's also that, yeah, right? And I think, you know, one of the things that's maybe most important, and you can you can dispute this, of course, but we're not taught to negotiate. You know, negotiate your mortgage rate, negotiate with your real estate broker, negotiate with your financial planner on your investment fees. We're just not taught. And, you know, it's like always financial literacy is about don't have the latte, don't have these little fun things, forego all of these these luxuries. And then we forget these ginormous numbers because you're like, well, what's a quarter of a percentage? What's a you know, what's 25 basis points? What does that mean? Oh, it might mean tens of thousands of dollars and you could have had 50 Starbucks a day. So as much <laughs> as, I, you know, <laughs> I don't really do advanced math in my head. I love math, but there's so many calculators that can show you, go have the coffee, go have fun with the little things. Please don't ignore the big things. That's where you're going to retire hundreds of thousands of dollars less or nothing or what have you. It's those little things on the big things that make a big difference. This is like the argument I have with my mom and I love it because she still to this day <laughs> yeah. does coup does, she does couponing, right? And she loves garage sales. And, you know, my whole life, I remember, you know, you preparing all spring for the big garage sale season and literally putting five cents on things and 10 cents on things. And then, you throw the big garage sale and you've been prepping for it for a week and you got all your friends bring all their junk. Then people come and they haggle you down. <laughs> At the end of the day, you know, I remember mom would be like, we made $400 today. And I'm like, all five of us in the family have been working for two weeks. Like we should have just thrown it in the garbage or put it in the, you know, yeah. give it to Goodwill or something. But she can't, yeah. she cannot, she will work. My mom will work all day to sell something for $20 and she'll be like, can you believe I got $20 for that? I'm like, I can't believe you spent all day for $20. Yeah. Like don't sweat the small stuff is such a great tip. And, and you know what, you brought up something interesting, which is about nego negotiating because a lot of people are, are a little bit afraid of confrontation and negotiating. Um, and I'm going to give a plug to a friend of mine, Robert Cialdini wrote a book about persuasion. Yes. And it is a fantastic yes. book. The, the, his six principles of persuasion are all very passive ways of persuading. Just saying mm -hmm. something like one of my favorite things is using the line, is that the best you can do? And I use this in real yes. estate all the time. When we're going back and forth on a negotiation, they're like, listen, you know, 400,000, this is it. This is my bottom line. And I'll just say, is that the best you can do? And literally they'll be like, fine, I'll do 390. And I'm like, I didn't really even negotiate. I just asked them a question, right? Like it's such little things you can use and learn about negotiating, which is so powerful, not only in your career, but in life. And and when when young people ask me, they're like, what's the one thing I should you know, focus on to be successful in life? Is that if you're only gonna learn one skill, learn sales. Because selling solves everything. If you can sell, you can, you can sell, if you can sell, you can figure your way out of any issue and you can create tremendous opportunities. That is, uh, you got me off on a tangent there of stuff that I really love. We need to have a whole other conversation about negotiating so that we can help yes. people fix these wage gaps in our society. Because I think you're right. It comes down to some people just aren't asking. Uh, it's, it's, it's silly little things that could fix a bigger problem, perhaps.
Yeah, and when I was at the bank, Scott, I didn't realize how many people would come in and just took the posted rate for, well, that's the posted rate. And I, like you, you do tons of media all over the country. I do tons of media, radio, it shows, and people will angrily call in, you can't negotiate on like, yes, you can. My mom negotiated. My mom's probably a lot like yours, garage sailor, that a whole thing. She negotiates at department stores, at like place I'm like, I mean, she challenges me all the time. She's like, I bet you could get a better price. Yeah, you ask them what's the best. What if you pay cash? And, uh, you know, we're just <laughs> not trained at all to do that. And you, I don't know how you feel about negotiating, but I got to tell you, my mom's an expert negotiator. And for me, I equated that with being poor. Like, I don't want to negotiate because that's what poor people do. That's what my poor single mom did because she needed like she needed the coupon. She wasn't clipping it because she was just frugal. She needed that money. And it wasn't till I was around my wealthy clients that I saw they didn't need the money and they confidently negotiated because they knew what they could negotiate. They talked to other wealthy people. They would talk to their other friends and say, what rate did you get on your mortgage and all that type of stuff. And it just blew my mind. So for someone like me, that's not comfortable. And I'd love to talk with you more about negotiating and hear your tips. And I love Robert's book too. It's brilliant is yeah, it's, it's the script. Like I love your, see, I, I would always say something like, you know, like, what did you say? You said, is that, what was your verbiage? Cause yours was a little bit different than I used. <laughs> for, which, what? for which, for which, for when you said it, Oh, can, can you do better? Can you, is that the best oh, you can do? Is, is that the best you can do? Is that That's the, the best that you can do? Is that the best that you could do? See, I, I like that because see it's nuanced, right? Cause I would say something like, Oh, is there anything else that you can do for me? And they would be, you know, so see, that's not a good one. I like that. Is the best, is that the best that you can do? And if they're holding back, they're like, no, that's not. And they got, so it's, it's those little things that's to give people the words of how to say yeah. it. I love it. So good. Absolutely. So good. We, we could crush yeah. it if you and I went out there with all this ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, the other thing that I think is important when it comes to a career, though, like even, whether it's negotiating your salary and other things like that, is that people I think one of the mistakes people make is they look at a, a career as like a means to an end. They're like, OK, I have my job and that's what's going to you know, that's the end goal is just work, work, work and then retire. Um, whereas, you know, when I'm working on training people who what I call extraordinary people stuck in ordinary life who want to do better. I tell them, why don't you use your job as an asset? Why don't you network and, you know, ask to be involved in the important meetings? And why don't you find the best way that you can add value, right? A lot of people will, a lot of people will try to, like you said, negotiate their way to ask for a raise, like, oh, I want a raise, I deserve a raise, switch it around. And it's a lot easier to get a promotion. Whereas if you go to your boss and say, listen, I feel like I'm not being used to my best capacity. How can I make you more money? That's, that's what your boss wants to hear. How can I make the company more money? How can I make you more money? Give me a task that will allow, allow me to prove my value. And then we'll talk about what I'm worth, right? So th that's the type of stuff that you, know, you need to test out at your job. It's not going to get you in trouble to tell your boss or your manager that you want to make the company more money. It's just going to put you higher on the radar and make you more important, right? And the best possible, the best possible thing you can do with your career is to leverage it. And I, I mean that by, you know, you go to get a mortgage, they're going to ask for your record of employment. They're going to ask, you know, how much do you make? And, um, how long have you worked here? And let me see your tax return from last year. So your job is actually one of the best tools you can use to start creating a second side hustle or another investment opportunity. 100%. And I, I, you're so right. Like people are like, well, one day when I can leave and open a business and one day when exactly use that, that stability. And that's something I wish I would have done, Scott. Like I had a job and then just like left and then you know, and then did the entrepreneurial thing. And that's, that can be really hard if you don't have that nest egg. So I do tell people too, you're right. Like, why can't you start your business 
on the weekend, in the evenings, start investing, whatever it is. And I love too about how you go and talk to your boss and just making yourself more valuable. I mean, one of my mentors said to me, he's like, you know, start to volunteer because when you volunteer and he didn't mean just volunteer, like go to the, uh, whatever at a concert, which is fun. That could be a way to save money. That's all good. But he was like, you really want to make yourself valuable, volunteer as a chair, get on important committees, do important work, because then you can call on people that will support that important work, answer your email that never would because you're a receptionist at a whatever. And that's kind of how I started. And But I got on all these important, prominent committees that then you're calling the mayor and they're returning your emails. So, you know, it's crafting that bigger vision for yourself while you're doing any job. You can still um, start to build a vision wherever you are at whatever age. If you're 70 and you're wanting to start something totally new or if you're 19 and just starting out or anywhere in between. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. It's so good. People, I find that majority of people aren't completely satisfied with just having a job and they are all honestly thinking the only option is another job or quit and do something else. When the truth is it's, you need to figure out what you can do as well as is the key. Do your job mm -hmm. as well as learning how to become an investor or creating your side hustle or being a bit of an entrepreneur and we can working those evenings and weekends and you know you can transition or if you've got something that you absolutely love your career um which was frustrating if it's not such an obligation it might actually become more enjoyable if you're like well i don't have to work here but it's not so bad anymore because the pressure's off right Exactly. Exactly. And I think too, you're so right. People go from a job to another job or to being an entrepreneur, thinking that there isn't going to be that pressure, that you've got all this wild freedom. You know, you, you have clients. And I think if you think of your boss and your workplace as a client, that they're a client, not an employer, your mindset is totally shifted because you're now like, how can I serve you? You're my client. You happen to be my only client. But sometimes when you're an entrepreneur, you only have one client too, and you don't like everything about them. Uh, so <laughs> when you have that mindset about serving your client and that regardless of your job, if you're an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, whatever term you use, that you're always you Inc. I actually wrote a whole book on it. And I know our friend Arlene also talks about this as well, about thinking of yourself as a corporation. And I wrote about this like 12 years ago, how start to think about your brand what do you stand for um you know all of these things and that will come through in everything that you do but always view everyone your spouse like you said about sales when you think of everyone as a client you don't have your spouse forever if you're not taking care of them that is not the way that it goes we all know that friendship it doesn't matter it's like if you view everyone as this very special client and how can you serve them you're you're going to i think you're going to be wealthier in a number of different ways you'll be happier if you know how to do sales especially if you know how to sell your children on doing the right thing <laughs> um we talked a little bit about mitigating consumer spending and um but this you know this one is a huge piece for me um i and i, I knew, and i'm gonna get this statistic wrong but i read several articles about people who win the lottery have one of the highest bankruptcy rates in the country, which is insane. Yeah. It's like the people who win millions of dollars become the poorest of people because they they raise up their spending to match their income, but it was like a one time thing. And um, and and a lot of people are struggling like just to meet the meet the day to day. Um, so what are like what is uh, what, it, what might be a good tip for somebody who's, you know, struggling to make ends meet, can't manage to get any savings together? What kind of advice would you have for someone like that? Yeah, and we do think, Scott, that getting more money is going to make us happier. And I did a lot of research on lottery winners. And you're right that the, the baseline of happiness, wherever your baseline is before you win the lottery, skyrockets uh, when you win the lottery. And after just six months, it drops right back down to wherever it was. And actually people are worse off financially because it's like that office tower I was talking about. You inherit an office tower, but you have the foundation of a little tiny house. 
So it all topples over because if you earn a million or $10 million over 10 or 20 years, you have that foundation to hold on to it. If you just get it, it topples over. Same if it's an inheritance or any of those things. And actually, it's so interesting that you mentioned it because there was a researcher that actually wanted to quantify the, um, you know, the effect of lottery winners. And although um, it's very unlikely you're going to win a lottery or your neighbor is, but be wary if your neighbor does, because for every thousand dollars your neighbor actually wins in the lottery, your chance of going bankrupt increases by 2.4% for every thousand dollars. Why is that? Uh, <laughs> it's phenomenal. And, and what I think it is, is I think that in our brain, we have what's called a mirror neuron. Dr. Rizzolotti, uh, an Italian researcher came, he discovered this. He had monkeys hooked up to probes and a researcher came and who was licking an ice cream cone. And all of a sudden the monkey's brain lit up with pleasure as if he was licking the ice cream cone. And so I think what happens is when we see our friends with toys that we secretly want, when we see our friends going on vacations that we secretly want, or we love golf and somebody hits that perfect shot, part of our mirror neuron lights up and we want it too. So we have to realize that when we're trying to keep up with the Joneses, it's not entirely your fault. It's your brain. That's why people watch these stupid unboxing videos. Who would watch a video? <laughs> why would you watch a video of someone else unboxing something you don't get? Because part of our brain loves this stuff. So to get back circuitously to your question about how do people, you know, that are just struggling, first of all, shatter the myth that for understand that your brain's working against you. It wants instant gratification and it wants what it sees. So you have to look at both sides of your income and your expenses, not just your expenses. It's not just all about cutting. And like I said, don't just look for the latte. Don't just look for the little things. Look for the big wastages. Are you carrying high interest rate consumer debt? You've got to get rid of that. It's going to kill you. You've got to go and see a nonprofit credit counselor or a certified financial planner. You have to get help because if you keep down that cycle, it is just going to, you're never going to get out of it. Um, and then also on the income side, if you never ask the question, how can I bring in more income? If you never call up your friends and go, what do you think my skills are and where I could maybe make some money from that? If you never ask that question, you're not going to bring in more money into your life. So it's not just about cutting the expenses. You've got to look at the income. That's so good. You just like blew my mind with some of those stats, but I totally get it. You know, you see things and you're like, I want that. And I take pleasure in that or whatever. But I mean, there's a balance there. I, I think it's healthy to see what's possible because you it's hard to believe in something that you haven't witnessed before right it's hard to believe something's possible that you haven't actually uh it hasn't been proven to you in some way so when you see someone doing extremely well automatically you're like i want to do well and then the second thing that sets in is the frustration that you don't have it perhaps or that you know there's a hurdle to get to it but maybe embracing that a little bit more and asking the right questions, like you said, you know, like how did you acquire those buildings or how have you bought that house? I always have been asking people, like, how did you, when I thought it was impossible to buy rental properties. I'm like, wow, if I ever just have a house, I'll be happy. And then I was just asking landlords, the guy I bought the house from had like six houses. I'm like, how did you get six houses? I don't understand. Like, who's going to give you money for six houses? And then he started to explain the cash flow. I was like, wow. You know, and it's, you know, do what successful people do. Find somebody mm -hmm. who has the things you want, ask them how they got there and repeat the process in some capacity. And, you know, you'll find the path of least resistance, ideally. Um, but there's a big component here, and this is where you and I are going to have to have a, a tough conversation because I want to talk about leverage. Right. Okay. And how leverage, how leverage works here. And because I am a firm believer that, you know, the ability to use leverage in, in a way that is smart and calculated is what allows the average individual to create a tremendous amount of wealth. But if you do this without being prepared or educated, you could find yourself reading another one of your books, which is about falling for scams and stuff like that. Right. Right. 
So you got to be really careful with leverage, but let's talk about the positive or like, let's talk about the, let's talk about the approach that you would use to using leverage in order to create wealth so that we can talk about a conservative, well-calculated way to creating opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we differ too much. I probably just am more on the risk adverse side for the average Canadian, because again, I don't think they've, you know, they've peeled the curtains back. So I think of it like a scalpel, a scalpel in the hands of a trained surgeon is going to do amazing things. A scalpel in the hands of a child wielding it around is um, going to do some very dangerous things. So I think leverage is like a scalpel. It's, it's who's using it and are they skilled enough to use it to their advantage or are they going to hurt themselves? Now, uh, somebody I admire very much is Michael Lee Chin. He's one of Canadians, uh, Canada's billionaires and uh, through incredible adversity growing up in a very poor uh, town in Jamaica, he's made billions of dollars, was the head of one of the largest mutual funds in Canada. I, I love this guy and I got to interview him and uh, do a big spread in, in a magazine for him. And he, he really believes in leverage. And he used to sell mutual funds for investors group. And he said, he said, you know, I'd sit in front of with a client and said, like, how can, how can I be the best value or use to you to help you build wealth? And he would show them, like, if you're going to take that $400 a month for all these years, like, you're only going to have this. And they'd be like, oh, well, we can't retire on that. And then he was like, okay, but if we had $400,000 or whatever number to put in, and it only was going to be $400 a month. Look at what you're going to retire with now. And it's like, like it, when you look at the numbers with leverage, it's mind blowing the tax advantage of the interest rate, all that type of stuff. You know what I'm talking about? So do your viewers yeah. don't have to explain it. However, I've also seen it go so incredibly wrong. And in that book on avoiding fraud and identity theft and investment scams, there was one woman and I had many, many stories like this where she had a bad mortgage broker that gave her some bad advice. She'd never had invested in her life, didn't have a dollar in anything. And she went to go and get a mortgage approved or a mortgage broker said, you know, I can approve you for another $150,000. And she was like, you can, she was like, yeah. And I suggest you go into this deal. I've been investing in it. And it, you know, they're paying monthly way more than your mortgage payment. Well, she didn't do her due diligence. She didn't even Google the person's name. She had never invested a dollar in her life. And yet she took $150,000 of leveraged money against her home to invest in something that she knew nothing about and didn't even take the time to do a Google search. So that's where I'm just kind of like, hey, people, I'm fine. If you've done your due diligence, you've ta talked to your certified financial planner, your accountant, your lawyer, you've got your own independent counsel and you understand what you're getting into, the quickest way you're going to build wealth, bar none, right? Through leverage. You're not going to Absolutely. Do it as fast through any other way. But just as long as you understand what you're getting into, I, I think it's absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. And I, you know, I, I appreciate your, you know, warning signs and uh, disclosure on these things, disclaimer on these things, because it's true. It, I like the scalpel example, right? Leverage can allow you to be super strategic and do incredible things. But if you just jump into it and you're like, oh, leverage, okay, I'll yeah. just use that. And, and you put it into something blindly, you're going to get yourself in trouble. And there's a balance to all of these things. You need to do some research. That's why I wanted to talk about the education piece. I wanted to talk about being frugal with consumer spending before we got to the leverage. Because right. using leverage with, for consumer spending or to invest in something you don't understand wow. is a huge risk and it gets people in big trouble. However, if through um, giving yourself a financial education, you can identify and evaluate returns properly, you know, using leverage is the best way to do this. You know, most people don't even have enough capital to start generating wealth. Um, so they just delay it and delay it and delay it and think, oh, I have to save up all this money if I want to do something. When the truth is, you know, our economy doesn't work that way. Our economy is the fundamentals of our economy have to do with leverage. That's what the whole stock market is, right? Businesses, your ability to borrow money and put it into something that makes you more money than all of your expenses and the cost of borrowing. And if you do that properly, you can create a tremendous amount of wealth. So 
I am, you know, I, and it blows people's minds when I show them how much money we have access to. And I personally believe that this might be the most <clears throat> opportunistic time in history, in absolute history, to be entrepreneurial and to um, and to use leverage. Because if you could just go back 10 years, go back 15 years, go back 20 years, interest rates were higher. Interest rates were a barrier to entry. You know, you could, you're getting mortgages at 18 and 19% in the eighties. That's not a good time to use leverage, but here we are, um, you know, in this day and age with interest rates at 1.8%, 2.2%. If you can't find a way to make money at an interest rate of 2%, it's a confidence problem more than anything, right? There's a lot of good ideas that have more than a 2% profit margin yeah. out there. So there's a there's not a lot of excuses not to pursue a good opportunity right now. And again, you don't wanna do it blindly, you have to do it in a calculated way. Um, but I, I'm actually really excited for people who are energized and who are entrepreneurial and who are motivated um, to make a big financial difference in their lives, because I think that we're going to see more wealth created out of <clears throat> the current condition than probably any other disruption we've had in our economy over the last 20 or 30 years. 100%. I agree 100%. Good. Wow. I left you speechless. Is that even possible, Kelly Keene? <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> I do. I do. Um, like you said, it's like you got to look for that opportunity. Absolutely. And, and with interest rates, it's, it's you know, but again, it's, it's, it's also the greed and the fear. It's like, don't be greedy getting in, like you said, pulling up those seeds and don't sit apathetic because you're so fearful to do something you haven't done before. Ask the questions, like you said, interview people, watch your programs, all that type of stuff, learn about it before you've already made a decision to say, that's not for me. Last thing I want, I want to do well, a couple little last things is talk about working with professionals. Um, this one's pretty simple. I mean, you're a pro, which is amazing. You're incredible at what you do. Um, you know, your books are fantastic guidance for anyone who has either struggled with finances or is just looking for an improvement on what they're doing financially. So I appreciate that. But um, I guess what I would like to know from you is what is your advice on surrounding yourself with the right professionals? Who are the right professionals to surround yourself with in the first place? Yeah. So, you know, you want to first know who they are. Like, when do you need a lawyer? And do you have someone on, on you know, like there's times to DIY things and there's times not to. Do you have a good accountant who's going to help you with the tax strategies of what you're doing? So important. You know this, Scott. Then I think you need to look at people like certified financial planners, qualified associate financial planners, and realize who you need when. So way back when, when I was in the industry, I was on the board of an apartment association and I was in the financial industry. And they said, you know, we don't like you people, you financial people, because all you want to do is get us to sell our real estate to invest in mutual funds or stocks or bonds or whatever. And that was very valid concern, right? So if you're a real estate investor, for example, you want to find a planner or an advisor that gets you, that isn't just going to try to continually make the case to sell you something they're going to make a commission on. But if you have a good fee only financial planner that doesn't sell anything and they don't make a commission on anything, they're going to help you with blind spots. Like someone at my, my, my personal training place the other day just asked me, he's like, can a minor own a real estate property? And I'm like, why are you asking? And he's like, because I'm going to leave my rentals to my children anyway. I just wanted to know if I could put it in their name now. And I said, you can't, but it might behoove you to set up a trust and all this type of stuff and introduce him to a fee only planner that really gets real estate. How about now, you know, when, again, when I was in the industry, I dealt with a lot of clients that bought rental properties in the fifties and sixties, they have, they were going to have huge capital gains issues when they passed away. And did they want to leave, you know, the taxation issue to their family to maybe have to fire sale properties at their death because they didn't have the money to pay the capital gains and should they have had life insurance to combat that and all that type of stuff. So 
you can see where a professional can kind of see some blind spots maybe you haven't thought about that can still support you, even if you're not investing any money with them, that it's important to at least interview different people and make sure, again, of course, you're doing your due diligence. And if you're buying anything, bring your own independent counsel and professionals. Don't you know, necessarily trust 100% that person's lawyer, that person's accountant, also do your own due diligence. Um, but I think, yeah, there's a case to be made that, that at certain points in your life, professionals are worth the money to bring in to evaluate your, your situation. And again, just for your viewers, I don't do any consulting or any coaching or anything of that sort. Um, I'm 100% on the edge because usually we get lots of like, can you do it? Um, I can't, yeah. I can give you resources of where to find pros, but I also can't recommend anyone for you because we, Scott and I are all over, you know, different countries. We can't monitor all these people enough. Um, but yeah, do your due diligence. And if you need help at least finding resources, by all means, my office can help you find resources to go in and, and find these people and questions to ask them. Absolutely. That uh, makes sense. I mean, if, if you want to become, you know, uh, if you want to become wealthy in the next 10 years, you know, I think that's a reasonable amount of time. We've talked about, you know, getting yourself educated at first. We've talked about reducing your consumer spending and get a little more aggressive with your investing. We've talked about leverage, but absolutely, it is almost impossible to become wealthy without surrounding yourself with a, with a team of individuals who understands how to help you get to your goals and who are aligned with your motivations as well, right? That's a big one. I am a, I'm a huge advocate of that. I have, uh, those are the five things, but I have one other item on here that I added on and I'm like, I'm gonna see if Kelly agrees with me, but I, I teased it at the beginning. There's, uh, there's one more thing that you can do that will severely accelerate or completely derail your chances of becoming wealthy. It might make you wealthy in half the amount of time. It might make you three or four or five times wealthier than, than you thought if you do this one other thing. Can you guess what that one thing would be? If you do that one other thing. There's uh -huh. one other thing that. that helps you get to your goals of success and wealth. Other than leverage? Like other than Yeah. Other than reinvesting your about. return? It's reinvesting your return? That's a good guess. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna get I'm gonna tell it to you because you're gonna know. This is why you're the this is why you're the master. <laughs> I, I, no, this no. is it. It's this one thing is a game changer. And I always do this when I'm training okay. real estate investors. I said, if you really want to become successful and you want to get do this faster and with more profitability. Find somebody who's aligned with you and do it together. Do it. Two people, two people, whether it's your, oh. your spouse, your brother, your kid, your best oh. friend. If you get into an opportunity with somebody, you will push each other so much harder, so much faster. And I, I use it in real estate, but in all, almost any business, one plus one equals three. And oh. if you want to see those kind of results, you find somebody who, who you can team up with. And uh, that's a huge you know, factor of success. You can do it alone. I always tell people these things are possible alone, but it's always more fun and there's more energy when somebody's with you. So it absolutely helps for sure. Well, I gave Love you shivers. That. So good, <laughs> so good. I think I saw that's you write that down. I did. It's a great metaphor for life. And I'm not, it, that's going to challenge my thinking, Scott, moving forward. Like, am I doing enough or have I thought to only forge my path individually? Love it. Brilliant. Yeah. You, you do have to surround yourself with the right people. And I think one of the toughest decisions yeah. I watch people when I'm training people in real estate investing, one of the toughest things is that they say, you know, my, my partner doesn't support me or doesn't believe in this or doesn't want to do this. And I see them processing this difficult choice. And, and then I meet some people who are like, I'm ready to do this because I'm here with my best friend. And for the last 15 wow. years, I was just with somebody who was a negative naysayer, never wanted to try anything. And now I'm, I have all this pent up energy and I see them do so extremely well. So there is a, you know, there are some, some shortcuts, I guess you can call them to success and they're very positive. So that was, 
So that was sort of one of my favorites. I was I wasn't sure if you were going to get it, but it's a bit of a trick question, really. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it. And I mean, it's interesting because I've got like such an incredible team professionally. But what I meant was for me investing, I go alone on all of that. I've never thought to partner on the investing side, although I would never, you know, conduct business without incredible staff and contract workers and partners. So I, I for me, that's where I'm taking it. Like uh, you have it over here, but you're not doing it over here. Good one. All right, Kelly Keen, how do people find you? What's the best way to find you? Just Google kellykeen.com. However you spell it, it's going to come up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're on Twitter and all the social channels. So feel free to reach out. Like I said, uh, we're happy to provide any any in, like resources and, and, and links and such to help you find what you need. Um, but yeah, it's been such an honor to be with you, Scott. I'm a huge fan of what you're doing for not just Canadians, but North Americans to, to shatter. And you shattered my thinking. It doesn't have to be 20 years. It can be 10. You got to be focused. You got to do your research and your due diligence, but you can do it. I love it. I'm a convert. Kelly Keen. Scott McGill, you're convert. the convert. <laughs> All right, Kelly Keen, you're the best. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Real Estate Rebel. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Scott. Bye. Awesome. Kelly is amazing. They are obviously, I feel like there's more podcasts to come with Kelly um, and we will get to those. But to sum up today's podcast, we talked about the five things you can do right now to help build your wealth and become rich in 10 years or less. Number one is to increase your financial literacy. And I would suggest reading a few books, going to some events. You might want to check out some of my real estate training webinars if real estate Investing is something you need to brush up on. Uh, leverage your career if you have one. You know what? You know, do the best you can at what you do, and um, but also look at it as, as a tool to maybe uh, get leverage or financing to invest in other avenues and network, 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 network. Try to get yourself included in the important uh, meetings at work so that you meet the the people who are making the big decisions. You want to mitigate your consumer spending. That means don't waste money on things that don't create value, that are depreciating assets. Um, consider leverage. You have to use leverage as a real estate investor in order to scale, uh, but you want to do it in the right way. This is probably what I spend most of my time teaching on is how to effectively use other people's money to generate wealth for yourself. Uh, work with a professional. You guys need to have a power team. We've talked about this on other podcasts as well, whether it be, you know, your trusted real estate agent, your mortgage advisor, um, your lawyer, your accountant, your property manager, you need a team to make this happen. And of course, you know, my uh, little secret weapon for speeding everything up and multiplying your profits is to have a great partner. You need the right partner on this, someone who really motivates you. So if you want to learn more about how you can build wealth through real estate, visit scottmcgillivray.com. You can always stop by the Real Estate Rebel Facebook group and leave me your questions. I'll get in there and try to get them answered for you. Make sure you like, follow, or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks so much for joining me. This has been the Real Estate Rebel with Scott McGilvery. We'll talk to you next time.